All right, so two days I've been asked to give you a talk, so entitled, so that's why we see basically here to advances in SPECT and PET molecular imaging modalities. Uh, this is the outline of the talk, so we start basically going quickly through the, uh, just give me a second here. Yeah, the theory of imaging construction, I, I think I'll just go pretty quickly through the slides, I mean, highlight the differences between what have been said by the previous speaker because he reviewed exhaustively I mean, the theory of image reconstruction, yeah, especially so uh, analytical reconstruction techniques. I'm going to focus on the uh, another category of techniques that has not been discussed, I think, in detail. This is called HRT reconstruction methods. And then we'll review so the principles of what we call gamma camera imaging, single photon emission computer tomography. Position emission tomography, which is so, so the, the second imaging modality that we use in nuclear medicine. And then we, we start basically so reviewing the advantages and drawbacks of software versus hardware integration of the imaging modalities, and then I'll summarize this talk. Right, so let's start with this definition of what we call molecular imaging. So when I started, I mean, do research in this area, so we call the field nuclear medicine, and then it shifted, so towards this, this concept of molecular imaging. So what this means, so we've got the definition by uh, Sanif Gambir, so one of the pioneers in the field from Stanford University, passed away just last year. So the definition that he gave is basically that molecular imaging is uh, visual representation, characterization, and quantification of biological processes at the cellular or subcellular levels within intact living organisms. And this is the definition that was adapted by our society, the Society of Molecular Imaging, Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, which says exactly so the same thing using simply different words. So I'd like this actually lecture to be interactive, so feel free to stop me and ask questions any time during the presentation, right? Um, so we have witnessed it, so a convergence of uh, multiple image capture uh, techniques with the kind of unprecedented collaboration between scientists coming from different disciplines. I think this is one of the few medical specialities where you don't have only MDs, medical doctors, but you have also so scientists having background in mathematics, physics, computer science, biochemistry, and so on. And then what emerged is basically, so what you see here is a major difference between the different imaging techniques that we use in medicine. So we've got on one side what we call anatomical, anatomic structural imaging techniques, and this includes ultrasound, right, which is echography, X-ray computer tomography, and the planar radiography as well, and then you've got magnetic resonance imaging as well. Magnetic resonance imaging has kind of broad spectrum, which is used also in functional imaging, and then probably I'll give you one or two examples later on. And then you have got, so this second category here, that are used more as a complement so to complement the anatomical or structural imaging modalities. We call them functional, so by default, physiologic, molecular, so whatsoever. And this includes optical imaging, which is, which is widely used in research and also so in, to image structures which are not really very deep inside the body. But it's widely used in small animal imaging, rats, mice, and so on. And then you've got single photon emission computer tomography, position emission tomography, techniques that we'll discuss in detail later on. Right, so within the uh, <coughs> spectrum of uh, medical imaging techniques, the sensitivity ranges from millimolar, so 10 minus 3, to submillimolar. Uh, um, sensitivity actually to detect contrast medium with X-ray, CT, and MRI to uh, peak or sensitivity with uh, positron emission tomography. Did not get used to this uh, tool here. To positron emission tomography, which has sensitivity of 10 minus 12 peak or sensitivity. So basically, the difference between the two different techniques is 10 to 8 or 10 to 9, right? So with respect to CC and MRI, so which is extremely high. So the, the idea here, so what's go we're going to review some of the last part of this uh, of this lecture is that we combine so the high spatial resolution of X-ray CT MRI 
we get excellent high spatial resolution with the sensitivity of molecular imaging to answer uh, a clinical or research question. So re the idea is really to combine and to take advantage of each, with the advantages of each, right? Very good. Um, so here what you can see basically, so some issues with the animations, I'm not sure if it's going to work out. J just to show you, I mean the beach in heart anyway, so you imagine that you've seen it. Uh, this should be, should be moving. So we were slightly actually shifting from conventional planar imaging techniques. I think almost all of you had the chest X-ray CD uh, to three-dimensional tomographic imaging modalities. So the advantage is that you see the structures which are deep inside the body because you, s you basically divide a large volume into small or thin slices so that you can have a display of the, of the 3D volume. And then we can add the time information. This is the fourth dimension, so basically what you see here, right? To basically be able to image organs in motion, like the myocardium that you see here, so you should be seeing it, so the heart beating. And then we can also image the, what we call the tracer kinetics, basically the evolution of the tracer after IV intravenous injection to the patient's body. So the tracer kinetics are going to change over time. And then with type of techniques, you can basically track the changes over time of a tracer which is injected to the patient. And then what you are seeing here, so is basically see the fifth dimension. Uh, with the fifth dimension, so basically use uh, uh, hardware integration of, uh, um, of PETS and CT scanner. So you've got the 4D already with the X-ray CT, and then you've got the fifth dimension, which is basically the signal that you see here which is overlaid on the X-ray CT to give you new basically access to the fifth dimension, which is basically the molecular signal, could be fluorodexaglucose, could be tracer targeting amino acids or uh, targeting the, um, what is of interest, radiation oncologist, uh, hypoxia. So different uh, metabolic processes can be, can be targeted with this uh, type of uh, techniques. All right, and then we, so in, in our hospital, so uh, a group of computer scientists developed this type of tools that you can simply uh, install. So it's, it's only, uh, it, it runs only on uh, Apple, so Macintosh, but there are plenty of open source software packages that you can simply download and uh, display medical images in DICOM, standard DICOM formats. So just to give you an example here, of software that you can use for research purposes. So very quickly, I think this has been really eluded in detail in the previous talks. Let's start very quickly with the principle of X-ray CT because the reason that I started with X-ray CT is that most of the, I mean 100% of the instruments that we use now in nuclear medicine are combined with either X-ray CT or MRI, so standalone specs or PET scanners do not exist anymore since almost 15 years. So the, I think Beer's Law has already been installed, so we've got flux of an X-ray beam coming through a medium having thickness of the X, and then this is basically so the link between the input and the output of the X-ray beam. And uh, the idea is really to be able to reconstruct the images for X-ray CT, so depicting mostly the anatomy within the or inside the patient's body. And then we are interested to have uh, uh, so large dynamic range. So this is why we use the, this factor of 1,000 that you see here, All right? But basically, the Hans field units are given by this equation. So it's very basic in X-ray CG. And uh, the idea is you've got so an X-ray tube here, what you see in the, in the top here, and then a bunch of X-ray detectors on the opposite side. Okay. And then you've got a bunch of detectors actually on the opposite side of the uh, of the patient, right? And then it collects basically the, the data with the infam beam, infam beam mode, right? And then we collect the projections that you see here, so exactly with the same formula that you have introduced it previously. And then we take the, the logarithm of the projections, so this is the first step before we proceed um, uh, to image reconstruction. So each, each view here corresponds to one line of response uh, in yellow that you see on the on the left side right and then the next step is uh, basically to collect data while uh, rotating the system around the patients so you've got the x-ray tube rotating uh, around the patients and you collect the data so in spiral 
uh, with a spiral trajectory. So each line of response here that you see corresponds to one point on the synagogue. This is how we save the data on the, on the external hard disks of the computers. And uh, basically, so you rotate and collect a certain number of views, and this applies to X-ray transmission and also to emission data, so what I'm going to introduce later on, right? So what's important to note is that each point here on the sinogram corresponds to a single view, right on an angle, and then a distance, what we call the beam, which is basically the distance from the center of the, of the scanner to the line of response that you see in the yellow here, all right? And then the, basically the principle of X-ray CT, as I mentioned, it is to rotate so around the patient, acquire the data in spiral formats, and spiral with a spiral trajectory, and to revert the procedure, so basically the, what we call image reconstruction from uh, projections. And in this context, so uh, what you see here is basically the filtered back projection, right? So the acquired projections are filtered in free space and then back projected, so line of response by line of uh, response to display basically the image that you see on the right side here. And I'm not going to review this in detail, but there are basically so two techniques. So the first one has been really explained in detail, what we call analytic, which is the exact uh, uh, inversion of the, uh, of the um, what we call the radium transform or X-ray transform, so depending on the, uh, on, on, on the acquisition model. So we've got basically a model describing the acquisition process, so requiring measured projections, these are the measurements. And then you've got the model which is going to invert, so you reverse in the radium transform basically to get the images from the measured projections. And do we have second uh, category, so uh, iterative reconstruction, which is obviously not limited to classical algebraic reconstructions that were described as well, but it includes also statistical uh, reconstruction techniques uh, that basically operate according to this, uh, to this um, <coughs> flow chart that you see here. So you start basically with the initial image, something that I'm going to describe later on. Uh, the initial image could be, for instance, a uniform cylinder, right? Or uh, a prior reconstruction that you get with filtered back projection, and then you forward project your images to get me measured projections, calculated projections that you compare to the measured projections, and then you've got the correction scheme here which is really variable, so you get some correction mechanism that updates the images, and the reconstruction is obviously iterative, so you do it as many times as needed, so number of iterations, so that to ensure that your algorithm converges. So this has been described, I think, in detail. So John Radon is famous Hungarian uh, mathematician, who uh, I think he was, um, uh, he got the citizenship of Austria later on, but the, the theory that he developed in the basically, so the 20th century, with the famous paper published in 1917, was unknown <coughs> to, uh, the, the, to the scientists who developed X-ray CT and SPECT uh, tomography in the 60s and the 70s. So they used it back projection to reconstruct without knowing that this theory has already been developed by this famous uh, mathematician. So again, this has been really described in detail. Let me just give you a few examples here in the context of X-ray CT. So really the, uh, our emphasis of the applications in the, in the field that, that are of interest to us with the, uh, so this is a sinogram and one projection. Uh, if you perform basically the back projection using only a single view, so you got these blurred images, even with the filtered back projection. So it doesn't work because a single view is obviously not sufficient. And then the idea is to collect sufficient number of projections around the, uh, around the objects. And with the basically X-ray CT, you need a pretty large number of, of uh, views, of angles. Uh, so in the range of 1,000, you see exactly here with 984. Uh, back projection, obviously, as I was explained at previously, produces blurred images with this uh, famous star artifact. And then filter back projection, obviously, is going to filter the projections and then remove the star artifact and you end up exactly with the image of the, of the of the silent of the phantom that you see here, so on the left side, all right? Okay, very good. So this is for X-ray compute tomography, and then with uh, emission tomography, so just one illustration here. Uh, again, so the same, or this is the XCAT phantom, so a phantom that we use in, in, in research. It's really a realistic so description of the uh, internal organs within the human body, and you can 
use it actually to simulate tracer uptake within the patient's body. And then we, through simulations, we can forward project so the biodistribution that you have in this function uh, to generate the artificial projections that you see here. And then we can apply the reconstruction uh, uh, either only back projection to see what the images uh, that you see here. Something is going wrong. I think there is no, I think it's the battery. Yeah, I think it's the battery, so. All right, so let's, let's switch to manual. Anyway, so let's, let's switch to manual. All right, so where you see the, the back projection only of the, um, of the projections that uh, you see on the right side here, and then filtering the projections before the back projection process is going to produce images that are close to the ground truth images that you see on the left side, right? Clear enough, back projection, filtered back projection. I think we spent uh, almost an hour on this in the previous talk. Very good, so let's um, talk about a little bit about the history of nuclear medicine, molecular imaging. So it started obviously with the discovery of radioactivity. All right, so uh, probably aware of uh, this uh, famous discovery, so in the beginning of the um, uh, 20th century by Pierre Marie Curie and uh, Henri Becquerel. So Nobel laureate in physics, all right? And uh, then you've got a number of pioneers that you see on the slide here, stand there starting from uh, um, uh, this guy, so I forget his name, Lawrence. Yeah, now he developed the cyclotron, so basically it's an accelerator that we use to produce uh, radioactive uh, material that you use to label uh, mo biological molecules to, to make uh, tracers that we use in the clinic. And then you've got also uh, another famous physicist, another Nobel laureate called Anderson, who developed or discovered so the positron. Without a positron, there will be no positron emission tomography, so a major discovery in the field. And you've got a bunch of other scientists, so let me just cite here, so the Hevesi, George de Hevesi. So there is a major award given by the Society of Nuclear Medicine that bears his name. And he is known to be the father of nuclear medicine because he was the first scientist who established it. He's a biochemist, by the way, Nobel laureate. Uh, developed the tracer principle, so to inject patients. He started with small animals, obviously. Inject with a radioactive tracer and then monitor or, or the progress of this radio tracer within the patient's body using this tracer principle. So this is why we call him the father of nuclear medicine. And then you've got a bunch of other pioneers, so Anger, uh, who developed the Anger camera that we're going to discuss later on. Hoffman and Tirpogosian, who developed also the concept of positron emission tomography, and then a bunch of other scientists, so probably we will have the chance to talk about them later on. So what's really fundamental to nuclear medicine or molecular imaging is this tracer principle. So we use basically radioactive isotopes like technetium-99, uh, which has a half-life of six hours. And then each radionuclide has obviously what we call a decay scheme, so it emits type of radiation, gamma, beta, whatsoever. And then there is a frequency associated with this, so 100%, 20%. And this reflects so, the number of emissions per radioactive decay. Uh, so you've got some uh, radionuclides that emit gamma photons, so gamma, gamma by definition is emitted by the nucleus, right? And then you have got some radionuclides that we use in positron emission tomography. So these are positron emitters. They emit positrons, beta plus. And uh, these are characterized so as well by the half-life. And if you compare the two categories, you see that for PET tracers, the half-life is extremely short. Oxygen, two minutes, right? So you really need to produce it in a cyclotron, inject the patient, so this your normal subject very quickly scan the patients and then get the um, signal that you need for your analysis. So this association between the radionuclide that emits the radiation and the biological molecule, which basically reflects the uh, behavior that you're targeting within the patient's body. So you put them together, inject to the patient, and then you monitor with external detectors, uh, basically, so the progress of the... Okay, seems to work. And then monitor basically so the, uh, uh, the tracer kinetics uh, through the external detectors. And we have a bunch of uh, radiopharmaceuticals. I think I have a slide on this. 
So this is a nice slide by IPES that basically gives you the different organs and the tracers that we use to explore those uh, pathologies within this, this organ. So there is really a very wide uh, a spectrum of tracers that we, that we can use in the, in the clinic. So let's start with the principles of uh, um, gamma camera imaging right in planar mode. So this is the famous uh, anger that you see here, so from the University of Berkeley. He was not lucky enough to get, uh, uh, to get a Nobel uh, uh, Award that I, th I think he deserved it by far. Uh, so the principle is that obviously we inject the patients with a gamma MCM radio, uh, radio tracer and then we put the patients in the field of view. So the uh, diagram here is not really to scale because the size of these uh, detectors is in the range of 50 centimeters by 30 or 40 centimeters. It's kind of a rectangle. And then basically it's, uh, the gamma camera consists of what we call a collimator. It's made of tungsten or, um, or lead, long, like, okay. And then the radiation, because the patient becomes radioactive, so the patient is going to emit radiation, so gamma photons. The emission is isotropic in all directions. And then the role of this collimator is simply so to allow only photons which are perpendicular to the detector that you see here to pass through the collimator. So those lucky photons that pass through the collimator are going to interact with the scintillator. So usually it's a sodium iodide, right? Sodium iodide doped with thallium. And then the role of this detector is to convert the um, energy of the gamma radiation to a scintillation light, right? And this light is going to be uh, um, basically transported by light guide through the PMTs, photomultiplier tubes. And then the role of these PMTs is to convert the light to an electrical signal that can be treated with the electronics that you see here. And then we display basically the images on the, on the computer, on the screen of the computer that you see here. All right, just to show you some of the uh, images that we use in nuclear medicine. So in oncology, the application is in basically so oncology, cardiology, neurology. We see some examples uh, later on. But this is basically 60, 70 percent of our exams using conventional imaging techniques, what we call bone scintigraphy, scintigraphy also. Right, so it's used basically so to uh, as part of the um, uh, as part of the exams, or the battery of exams that we need to depict uh, bony metastasis, so for certain types of cancers, prostates uh, for men, and then the, um, um, it will come to my mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically the uh, mammography, so for, uh, for uh, females. Uh, they develop bone metastasis, and this is the gold standard exams that we use in the clinic to depict bony metastasis. Uh, and based on this, so we decide if the patient is a candidate for surgery or for any other uh, treatment uh, technique. And these are other so pathologies like the thyroid, so with the iodine 131 uh, or 123. It's 131 here, and this is a, a MIBG, another tracer that we use for neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumors. All right, so um, basically, so this is how the gamma camera is uh, operate. So we've got uh, a crystal of a certain size. Uh, this is the typical size that you see here. It has a certain crystal, a certain thickness, I'm sorry. Sodium iodide, so there's some technological constraints on the thickness. So typically used 9.5 millimeters is the focus is to emit, uh, is to image or to scan. So. Uh, uh, low energy uh, uh, photons like technetium, which emits at 140 kV. And then you can use also uh, more th or thicker crystals if you image iodine 131 as well. And then you've got a certain number of photomultipliers. These are just some figures actually that I got from the literature. And the standard now is really to use digital electronics to digitize the signal and to process it with the electronics to produce the signal. So the collimator is really the fundamental so, um, um, uh, toolkit that we use actually for planar uh, scintigraphy. There are basically four different geometries. So planar geometry, which is the most widely used. Uh, there is direct correspondence between the object size and what you see on your screen, what you see on the image. 
And there are uh, other types of uh, collimators, basically what you call the pinhole collimator, stenope en français, uh, which basically has, is going to invert so your object on the screen and it has a significant zoom factor. So it's used for imaging small organs like the thyroid and we use it also for pediatric applications for small babies. Uh, you've got also the, the diverging and the converging collimators that use basically to increase the size of the field of view or to decrease the size of the field of view. So depending on the application, so we use different types of collimators. So I'm going to limit so the, this comparison to the slide that you see here. Just to highlight the advantages and drawbacks of those uh, different types of collimators. So this is an old slide uh, comparing basically the spatial resolution and the sensitivity of different types of collimators. So the pinhole collimator is what you see here. So the, according to the size of the, of the pinhole, uh, you've got so different resolutions. I think you have two, two of them here, uh, or maybe more. So three, you've got three uh, diameters of the pinhole. And then obviously, so the sensitivity of the planar uh, collimator is not good, going to change with the distance, so there is no change. Uh, because of the geometry, because it's parallel, so there is no change of, uh, with the distance. And then the spatial resolution is going to degrade for the planar, for the parallel collimator. Uh, and uh, you've got the same, same trend for the other collimators as well. So depending on the sensitivity and spatial resolution that you need, so you can choose the uh, appropriate collimator for your uh, applications. Very good. So how do we put basically the PMTs on top of the uh, sodium iodide crystal? I think you see it very nicely here. So these are the PMTs here on the top, which are directly glued or attached to the sodium iodide crystal. And we have got a mechanism called Anger logic because it was developed by, uh, uh, by Anger. And the, the idea basically is to, uh, depending on the proximity of each PMT here uh, from the interaction point, so the PMT is going to generate a certain amount of, uh, of signal, of light, all right? And then you have a light sharing scheme between the different PMTs. For instance, if you got so an interaction, just give me a second. So we've got basically the interaction taking place here. So this PMT is going to produce a certain amount of light, and the PMT, is, which is uh, farther away from, this, uh, from the interaction point, is going to emit uh, a smaller amount of light. And then by combining, so the amount of signal produced by the different uh, PMTs, so if you, you basically estimate the coordinates X and Y, and this is how you estimate your, uh, your interaction points. Right, so this is a really conventional technique implemented on almost 100% of the uh, conventional gamma cameras that we use in the, in, in the clinic. So it's basically so a mixture of uh, uh, small resistors, so it's not uh, something which is really a uh, high-tech uh, uh, stuff. Good, so now coming to the readout technologies, so we use conventional photomultiplier tubes. And the mechanism, I think, is uh, extremely well understood. But we use also what we call position-sensitive photomultiplier tubes, basically what you see here, especially for when the higher resolution is desired, which is the case of small animal imaging because of the size of the mice and rats, so we need the higher resolution. And then there are some uh, new uh, phot uh, photo detectors which are used as well in imaging technologies. For instance, we'll see later on, so PET combined with MRI or SPECS combined with MRI, so we cannot use PMTs because the PMTs are not going to work out within a high magnetic field. And the magnetic field is going to be also uh, disrupted by the metals that you have in the PMTs and uh, all sorts of the high voltage that you use to operate the PMTs. So this is uh, what we call the avalanche photo detectors that you see here, or the silicon PMTs. They are MR compatible, which means that they can operate within the magnetic field and then we use them when desired, actually, especially on SPECT MRI or PET MRI systems, because they have this advantage compared to conventional uh, photomultiplier tubes. So this, what I have said, is basically so for gamma cameras operating in planar imaging mode, which means generating two-dimensional projection images. And then we can use the same mechanism that I described earlier for X-ray computer tomography, which means rotating the detectors around the patients to acquire the data in multiple views and multiple angles. So this is basically one of camera dedicated for brain imaging. We rotate the cameras around the patient to acquire 
multiple views so between 32 64 up to 128 views and then we basically use the same theory that I explained it before to reconstruct the images from the measured projections and then we present them according to the transactional sagittal or coronal orientations to the MDs or to the nuclear medicine physician who is going to report uh, on the uh, uh, his uh, diagnosis basically to, or to plan the therapy based on these images. So I think the, the concept is very uh, basic so we basically instead of getting a single uh, planar uh, uh, projection so we rotate the detectors around the patient to acquire multiple projections according to the different angles and then we save the data exactly as in X-ray compute tomography in sinogram format so each point within this matrix reflects uh, basically so line of response what you see here in yellow right and then we apply the same theory that I described it before either filtered back projection which means filtering the projections in Fourier space and then back projecting them line of response by line of response to get the image or use one of those most advanced uh, iterative reconstruction techniques that I'm going to touch up on later on. Very good. So I'm going to discuss basically very quickly, just in a couple of slides at the end of this uh, of this lecture. So the role of uh, of the physicists within uh, nuclear medicine departments, because we need to apply a number of quality control procedures to make sure that the gamma camera is uh, uh, operating uh, uh, according to specifications. But what's important to mention here is that what we call the non-uniformity is because the detector, the sodium ion, the detector has a very large uh, surface, so 40 by 50 or 30 by 50 centimeters, and you've got some non-uniformities. For instance, depending on when you are within the, uh, the field of view, so the uniformity is going to change because it's also linked to the gains of the, of the PMTs. And, and these non-uniformities, basically, you're not going to notice them on planar images. They're going to be amplified when you use tomographic imaging because if you got, basically, so an artifact on one view is going to be uh, amplified when you uh, retroproject or uh, the images to get the tomographic images. And this is a well-known problem that generates uh, high artifacts on your images if you don't do this uh, uh, correctly. So these are the more, uh, more standard so gamma cameras compared to the old ones times that you have seen. So this is more uh, state of the art. So different uh, specs combined with CT gamma cameras exist in the market. Uh, so the three manufacturers are basically so Siemens, General Electric, and Philips. We're mostly a Siemens site so in our facility, but obviously I'm not going to advertise for this company. And uh, so the applications are mostly what I described before. So uh, almost, uh, I would say 50-60% uh, of our applications is clinical oncology, so cancer patients. And the cardiology has also the 34-35% um, uh, and neurology is really uh, a small portion. So these are basically specs and uh, cameras. What you see here is control subjects. I'm sorry. So what you see is basically the typical biodistribution that we observe so for perfusion scans in the brain. And this reflects a so deficit of tracer uptake in those areas here, which is indicative of the presence of a neurodegenerative disease. And this is, for instance, uh, patients suffering from dementia, so uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, right? Uh, uh, cardiology, so is also, so as I mentioned, has the, uh, the lion part in our examinations. And it's very common, so to acquire the data combined with uh, X-ray CT, as I mentioned previously. Right, so these are more advanced designs. So there's a company, there's a company called Spectrum Dynamics, which has a very an interesting concept, especially for cardiovas uh, cardiovascular disease. So they have kind of uh, multifocusing uh, collimators that you see here. And this enables actually to get the collimator close, cl very close to the patient's body, right? And this tends to improve substantially the uh, sensitivity and the spatial resolution, so to provide kind of a better so a combination of the advantages of conventional designs. And this is a more recent design, actually, of the same system. So the company's name right now is Molecular Dynamics. And I think I have an animation here, if it works. Yeah. So this simply gives you so, how the system works. Um, 
So we've got those uh, coding mirrors actually that can move towards the patients. So according to the specifications of the users, so the applications are multiple. Um, the initial design was basically tar targeted to cardiovascular imaging, uh, but the uh, Veriton, which is the recent, uh, most recent design, so it's used basically uh, CZT, which is semiconductors. So there is no need for PMTs because CZT converts directly to the gamma cameras to an electronic signal. And then it enables actually to scan extremely fast with a lower dose to the, to the patients. So an extremely useful design. Good. So uh, now this, uh, this type of technology is not only used in clinic for, uh, uh, to scan patients, but it's also used in research settings, right, so for biomedical uh, research. And we have in our facilities a couple of uh, small uh, animal spec systems dedicated basically for small animal research. We've got this one and, uh, and that one. So those two are installed in our facility and we use them extensively in research. So this is combined with X-ray CT and more recently it's combined also with optical imaging. This is a tri-modality system and I think I've got slides later on that I'm going to show you. Okay, so let's start now with the second part of the story, so positron emission tomography. So PET basically so was started in 1952 with the use of uh, positron emitting tracer by uh, uh, scientists Brownell, Sweet and colleagues from Massachusetts General Hospital so in Boston. They were basically the first to realize the image that you see here for brain tumor. They used the position emi emission uh, emitting tracer, but without a dedicated uh, PET camera because the technology did not exist at that time. So they basically acquired the scans that you see here by collecting the data in single photo mode. And uh, then, so position emission tomography was developed in the 70s by Tirpogosian and Hoffman, so the two guys that I showed you before. And they provided actually so the images that you see here. Then so one of my closest friends and mentor, Professor Abbas Arabi from uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, in, Pitt, in, uh, in Philadelphia. So was the first actually who used, who used FDG, so fluorodexic glucose, which is the equivalent of sugar, so with some differences. And he was extremely uh, proud to show the first PET uh, image with fluorodexic glucose to his colleagues, radiologists, who were extremely excited about the introduction of MRI, uh, uh, right? But the radiologists were not very excited about position emission tomography. But the advantage that he showed is basically small numbers that you see here. So with PET, you can quantify uh, blood flow or uh, uh, glucose metabolism, so th something that you cannot really do with, uh, with MRI. And then he produced also this first whole body PET image that you see here basically by acquiring the data with an external uh, detectors without the uh, dedicated technique because the axial field of view was extremely small at that time. And here you basically see the images, evolution of the quality of PET images for the brain. So you can appreciate actually the low resolution in the first design of the 70s. Pixel size was close to one centimeter, so very low spatial resolution. And then now, so the spatial resolution is close to basically 2, 2.5 millimeters. So we can actually image organs uh, to very high spatial resolution, taking advantage of basically what you see here, so scintillation crystals uh, that have a higher stopping power, fast electronics, advanced reconstruction techniques, and, and so on and, and, and forth. So what, what do we need basically so, uh, to operate a PET um, a facility is what we call a cyclotron. So recall the discovery of uh, this famous scientist who developed the first cyclotron uh, through a grant from um, uh, a private foundation in the States. And that you need what we call the hot cells because the amount of radioactivity is extremely high. So we're not going to manipulate this with the fingers. So we use these robots here to manipulate the radioactivity. And this is one of the synthesis models that we basically use in the clinic to produce the, the tracers. And these are a so bunch of tracers actually that we use in clinics to so depend on the clinical indication. FDG is the most widely used, though this one here. It's used for neurology, for to study myocardial viability. It's also it's used in clinical oncology because the cancer cells, they tend to have a higher metabolism compared to normal cells. So you can basically have 
uh, a very high contrast between the two. And then uh, other tracers for perfusion imaging, for targeting tumor hypoxia, uh, blood flow, and, and, and so on. Good, so what is the principle of positron emission tomography? So obviously we're injecting positron tracers, beta plus. So beta plus is the antiparticle of the electron, which means they have same properties but opposite charges. Electron is charged negative, and then the positron has a positive charge. So once the positron is emitted, so it travels a very small distance. Uh, you've got some numbers here, depending on the energy of the positron and the correspondence of full width of half maximum of this range. And then it basically interacts with the electrons that we have in biological tissues to produce what you call the positron process, right? And then the end is the emission of two back-to-back -back annihilation photons, 180 degrees apart. And then we call like the data in coincidence mode, which means that we accept the events only if they fall within a specific coincidence window, which is going to depend on the properties of the scintillation crystal. And then we require the data exactly in the same way, so in cyanograms, um, right, which cyanogram corresponds to what I explained it before, and then we apply the same techniques to reconstruct the images from the measured projections, basically inverting the procedure as I uh, described in the detail. So let me just spend a couple of minutes on this statistical reconstruction, which was not described, I think, in the previous talk. So we basically measure on the, this is what the scanner gives you, right? It gives you the, this measured projections. And then we have, this is the maximum likelihood expectation maximization algorithm and its variant, what we call the ordered subset expectation maximization. So the idea is to generate artificially projections from uh, an initial guess, all right? Uh, that's what we call the iteration number zero. And we, uh, by convention, we start with the uniform cylinder. So we generate artificial projections. And there is a co correction mechanism which compares the projections, the measured ones, with the artificially generated ones. And then you have the correction procedure, which is going to amend or to modify the uh, images at the different iterations till you produce so the desired, uh, uh, the desired uh, output. Uh, now, the, uh, this is one of the techniques that uh, algorithms implemented on commercial scanners. Uh, so just to show you, this is the acquired images. This is the ACFs, what we call the attenuation correction factors, that we uh, basically so produce from the CT scans that you see here. So this is a correction mechanism, and these are some random events, scatter events, a few things that I'm going to describe later on. What is important here is to show you some clinical images comparing to so conventional filtered back projection, which generates uh, awful images, images of extremely low quality. And the advantage of iterative reconstructions, which produce images of much, much improved quality. And again, this, so this is not really state of the art. So this was produced basically in 97, 98. And you can appreciate it also so the, the better uh, image quality uh, produced basically with iterative reconstruction techniques in the sense that the noise and the significant artifacts that you see in conventional feature the back projection are uh, removed uh, later on and you see the same effect here. But uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that basically so we don't know how many iterations to use in clinical setting uh, to allow the algorithm to converge. So what we know is that a certain number of iterations have to be used and that adds, if you increase significantly the number of iterations, the algorithm is going to diverge, and then you end up with very noise, with noisy images. So according to the experience, so we need to stop the algorithm at a certain number of iterations, and this is how we do it in the clinic. Which means that there is no objective criterion telling you how many iterations to apply in the clinic. Uh, so it's really according to the experience that you have and the recommendations from the scanner manufacturer. Uh, there is another concept that we call a resolution recovery uh, statistical uh, reconstruction. And the, basically the idea here is that uh, depending on when you are in the transactional field of view, so the spatial resolution is going to vary. So for instance, you get a very good spatial resolution here, two millimeters. And then when you deviate from the, or you, you go off uh, center by 10, 15 centimeters, the spatial resolution usually degrades because of the geometry, cylindrical geometry of the scanner and uh, the associated artifacts. So we use this resolution recovery 
reconstruction, basically by incorporating some a priori knowledge about the geometry of the system. For instance, we can measure multiple point sources at different, different uh, positions here within the field of view and use those estimated spatial resolution at multiple positions during the resolution recovery image reconstruction. So this type of techniques basically improve the spatial resolution. So this is the page, some patient data reconstructed without and with resolution recovery. And look to the intensities of the signal here and here. So much, much improved spatial resolution when you use those techniques. Again, for the brain. So this is the high definition path for basically resolution recovery without additional filtering compared to a conventional 3D uh, on, uh, OSCM reconstructions. Uh, but the problem with this type of techniques is that in some cases, probably 1-2% of the clinical studies, uh, we can also highlight this through phantom studies, there is an analyzing that takes place and uh, you can see it basically here with this multispherical phantom. If you get a line profile, you see this overshooting, right? So this elysian artifacts or overshooting can take place in a number of situations. And this is we prefer not to use it in multi-institutional uh, clinical trials because it generates some artifacts. But obviously, so it has major advantages in the majority of cases because it improves substantially the image quality. And you see it also in brain scans, so this, uh, like you see in this example here with the overshooting. All right, so let's move on to the instrumentation now. So uh, the majority or almost 99.99% of the PET scanners, and the, by the way, do you know how many systems you have in Algeria, how many PET scanners, how many you have? One. One in the public and one in the private, right. It's yeah, it's Isuzu and Hospital Mayo, yeah. All right, so we've got only two. Very good, so this is the geometry, so it's basically cylindrical geometry. And the axial field of view depends on the scanner manufacturer, so it goes from 16 centimeters for Philips, for instance, up to 22 or 25 centimeters in terms of axial field of view. So to do a whole body scan, basically going from the brain, from the head to the two, it's almost one or 1 1.2 uh, meters or 100 and 120 centimeters. You need to do multiple scans, basically by translating the patient's, uh, the patient's bed, and then you carve multiple, uh, multiple images covering different fields of view, and then you uh, stack the images at the end to get the whole body images. Uh, so this is one geometry, and then you've got some systems dedicated for brain imaging, for breast imaging, so with a limited axial field of view, smaller diameters to get better spatial resolution. Prostage, we have a project actually with uh, with CERN in our facility to design a system for prostate imaging. And then some systems dedicated for small animal imaging. I'm going to show you some examples. There is also uh, a couple of uh, research groups actually and one company that produces systems dedicated for total body imaging. So the axial field of view is close to two meters, right, for this design. And then for Siemens, I think they have a system with one meter axial field of view, so you can scan the patients actually extremely quickly. So let's go quickly through the history. These are some of the concepts used for brain imaging, a very high spatial resolution, close to two millimeters, for instance, for the uh, high resolution research tomograph produced by Siemens, so the GPEDs by Philips, and some uh, Japanese research groups who are interested actually in uh, um, depicting areas within the brain which are involved within certain psychometric procedures. For instance, they're interested in language, so they need to scan the patients in different postures, not only lying in the bed, they could be sitting or they could be doing something, looking to video sequences. All right, so they designed this system with a spatial resolution close to three millimeters, and this is a very interesting design concept called the PET hat, and I think I have, m I have more designs later on. So what we do as physicists is to scan basically so uh, this type of phantoms that you call the 3D Hoffman phantom and uh, to compare basically so the expected, so this is the gold standard because we know exactly the biodistribution within this phantom when we inject tracer and then we compare the spatial resolution attained by the different systems just for qualitative assessment and this is a patient scanned it twice on the commercial system and on the brain-dedicated system, and I think you can appreciate the 
improvements in, in, in spatial resolution, you see really the uh, very small details within the uh, cortex for, this, uh, for these patients. And then you have more recent designs, obviously, so we tend to have a better coverage actually uh, around the patient to increase, to improve the sensitivity. We need to get the detectors closer to the, to the brain to improve the spatial resolution. So this is the pet hat concept. Uh, this is a commercial design by a Spanish company and then a number of other designs that are uh, used for mainly for research. There is an interest also to be able to scan subjects while they are working, right, to depict areas in the brain that are involved in this type of, of, of processes. And uh, there is uh, one uh, group actually working involved heavily in this type of research. So trying to understand basically some physiological mechanisms by getting the patient, the, the subjects in different postures, doing different psychometric tests and uh, involved so in their uh, daily activities. Uh, PET is also used for mammography, so there are some systems uh, used for uh, mammography. Uh, so you see this system here called the PEMFLEX. Uh, mammography has a number of limitations, especially where we have dense breasts, very small lesions, so we can miss them. So now, uh, MRI is uh, basically the gold standard procedure that we use. Uh, but PET mammography is also widely used in a number of um, uh, centers. And uh, with this type of design, so you see basically when you scan the Lorenzo Phantom, which has um, uh, basically rods giving you some different spatial resolutions, and then you can appreciate the comparison between the system dedicated for whole body imaging having a spatial resolution close to four millimeters with the system designed specifically for the um, for mammography with a very high spatial resolution, so you can depict basically a uh, resolution of 1.6 millimeters and this improves the detectability of small lesions. And you've got a clinical case here, patients with two IDC lesions that you see clearly on the MRI and also depicted on the PES mammography and obviously so the gold standard is uh, the pathology, so the pathology confirmed the uh, presence of these two IDC uh, lesions. Sorry for the noise here, but this, uh, these are systems actually used in uh, biomedical research to scan uh, animals. <coughs> so the animals could be uh, either, we can administer anesthetic procedures to scan the patients where they are anesthetized, or we can have basically the animals in its living environments using two design concepts. So this is with infrared cameras where we can basically get the position of the animals and then use this to save the data, or we can simply use the pet hat concepts by putting the <coughs> detectors around the brain of the of the animal, and then leave the animal in his own in his own uh, living uh, environments. Uh, this is very interesting for neuroscience type of research because we'd like to scan the animals in their normal living environments without the use of uh, anesthesia. Very good. Okay, so this is the um, Explorer. designed by a group from the University of California, Davis. So it has an actual field of view uh, about two uh, meters. Uh, so this is not really a new concept because the, the idea of having a whole body system uh, started in, I mean, the discussion started in the 80s and the 90s. But this is the, the first group actually who managed to get funding from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the States. They got almost $16 million to design the system that you see here. And these are the PIs. I think you'll see them in the next slide. So these are the PIs, Ramsey Badawi, Simon Shuri, and, uh, and uh, John, I um, forget his name, so John something. So they designed the system actually with two meters actual field of view. Uh, very proud of the system. So with the two meters long cylinder, cylinder of germanium 68, that was used to characterize the performance of the system. And I think I have some clinical studies. Yeah, this is one of them. Uh, so because of the large axle field of view, so we can shorten the acquisition time. And they demonstrated actually, so to images, the clinical uh, quality with only 37 seconds uh, acquisition time compared to the 20 minutes for the conventional systems and the other Advantage is that you can basically so start the data acquisition following the injection of the tracer 
and uh, recall the tracer kinetics that you use for uh, physiological modeling for tracer kinetic modeling to quantify physiological and meta metabolic processes uh, in, in vivo. So, uh, so right now, so there's uh, the three major groups. Uh, United Imaging commercialized the system that I showed you. So it's a Chinese company. Siemens has have a system with one millimeter uh, axial field of view, and uh, probably so Philips can uh, take the design from the group of uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, please go ahead. I just have a question about yeah. the substance that they inject to the, uh, the patient. Yeah. Uh, I believe, uh, I mean, I'm just not taking it to how, how it works. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, it's not, no, it's not. So basically, so we take F18, so this is FDG as a tracer, so FDG is the equivalent of sugar with some more differences. So we take FDG as a radionuclide and then we attach it uh, to the oxyglucose, which is the equivalent of sugar. So the only difference with sugar is that sugar is later on eliminated by the cells, so it goes out of the cells and then the oxyglucose remains within the cell and this is why we see the increase in the uptake with time. Well, the exposure is a different story, so I have a slide on this, I will, I will highlight this later on, yeah. But obviously it's not dangerous for the patient. So there is um, 11.30, okay, so let's, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes, so just to give you enough time for questions. Uh, there is a concept called time of flight that uh, people who know MRI, so there's also time of flight in MRI, in the context of positional emission tomography, so the idea of time of flight is different in the sense that we take advantage of, because the two annihilation photons which are emitted in opposite directions travel with the speed of light, so, right? The speed of light, which means uh, 300,000 kilometers per, uh, per second. And then, uh, depending on when you are, so on the line of response, so you can imagine that this photon here can reach this detector before the second one reaches the second detector and take it advantage of a high temporal resolution of the crystals that we use in, on, on PET scanners. So we can correlate basically the coincidence time uh, resolution, right? So knowing that the spatial resolution is limited by a number of uh, factors, basically what you see here, so the size of the detector, the coding, so by coding I mean how the crystals are associated with a bunch of PMTs to recall the, uh, uh, the uh, detection points or the interaction points, the diameter of the scanner, small diameter, uh, basically involves better spatial resolution and, the, and vice versa. The positional range that I showed you, F18 versus rubidium, there is a difference in terms of spatial resolution. Then the depth of interaction, so if you've got your crystals, they have a certain depth, 20, 30 millimeters. So depending on when the interaction takes place, so we, there could be an additional factor, uh, actually the gradient of spatial resolution. So the ideal actually is to have a coincidence time in uh, resolution quell, close to 20 picoseconds, uh, so that no reconstruction is basically needed. If we know that uh, if your system has a, a spatial resolution of 20, 20 picoseconds, you'll be able basically to depict so small segments close to the desired spatial resolution, basically, so one to two millimeters, so there will be no need for uh, image uh, reconstruction from projection. So what you see here is basically the coincidence time resolution of different PET scanners that are used in, the, in clinical settings. So where the standard was close to 600, so we have 550, uh, 580 picoseconds, and now we have systems with uh, coincidence time resolution close to uh, 214 picoseconds. So this is the vision scanner that we installed in our facility last year. And the target of uh, scientists is to have systems with close to 100 picoseconds or in the near future, so probably so 20 or 10 picoseconds. All right, so just, just to show you the advantage of this high temporal resolution and time of light. So this is the same brain of uh, patients, so scanned it twice on the MCT scanner having uh, a coincidence time resolution of 550 picoseconds versus the vision with 214 picoseconds. So you see basically so the improvements in the spatial resolution. So clearly what is highlighted by the arrows here, uh, I think it makes sense to you. It's better to display it obviously on the 
on the computerized screens that you use in the clinic, but even the PowerPoint, I think you can appreciate the improvement in the spatial resolution. So this is what the biograph vision, just to show you how a PET scanner looks like. And this is another case comparing so the patients also acquired uh, on the MCT or scanned on the MCT versus the vision. So some lesions here, which are high, very extremely hard to depict on the MCT, and the improved spatial resolution, so basically, uh, and the sensitivity uh, as well, so causes actually the uh, lesion to be uh, easily depicted on the PET scan that you see on the right side. Now we move into the third item or the fourth item, which is uh, software-based uh, image uh, registration. So before the advent of combined uh, PET CT or SPECT CT, SPECT MRI systems, our MD tended to have X-ray CT or MRI, and then the nuclear medicine scan, and then they do the registration manually. So trying to put the slices in correspondence. Uh, later also, computer scientists and physicists developed automated uh, registration algorithms, and those registration algorithms tend to work quite well for rigid organs such as the brain, because the brain is rigid, it doesn't move, right? So through this type of rigid body registration, you basically so start again so with the, uh, a certain number of uh, parameters, and then through the mutual information or normalized mutual information, so you automate the process, which is obviously iterative. So you go through as many iterations as needed uh, to get the desired output. And this type of techniques work quite well for the brain. So submillimetric uh, accuracy in terms of uh, um, registration accuracy. So this is basically what you see for FDG as a tracer with high resolution MRI. And this is the de facto gold standard produced uh, technique that you use in clinical settings, especially for epileptic foci. Uh, um, the picture for uh, epileptic scissors. So we basically um, acquire the PET's uh, image, uh, co-register it with the uh, MRI uh, image, and then through the fusion here we guide the uh, surgeon, neurosurgeon, uh, so that he knows exactly so where to operate and where to resect the epileptic uh, foci. Uh, so this type of techniques work quite well for the brain, but they're extremely quite challenging where you go so to the upper uh, abdomen or to the thorax. Uh, because you've got some differences in terms of breathing patterns, so the X-ray CT takes a few seconds, uh, while the PET scan takes three minutes, four minutes, depending actually so on the protocols. So these differences in breathing patterns cause some misregistration between uh, PETs and the CT images, but through careful uh, adjustments of the protocols, so you can get uh, good quality registrations, as you can see in this example on the right side. So basically the idea of non-rigid registration, so contrary to rigid body registration, is that we need to get pixel by pixel um, uh, motion vectors, here estimate of the motion vectors, and then we use those motion vectors basically to align the two, uh, the, the, the two images. So just to give you one example here, I think some a funny example, so this is uh, for those uh, who read the book, so the physics of, uh, of radiation uh, uh, therapy. So this is a famous Canadian physicist. And uh, he was basically so uh, training one of his uh, PhD students. So he gave, he gave him his picture and the picture of this baboon here and asked him to do a registration between the two, between the two photographs using the thin spline uh, based image warping techniques. So you see the outcome here. So we take a number of, uh, of points on the two images, and this is the outcome. It works, right? So see here the, so another, another funny example here. So this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know him, right? And this is a famous singer. I don't know, Britney Spears. Okay, thank you. And you see here the, see the registration, how it works. It works nicely, right? So there is no need for hardware-based integration if it works like this. Anyway, so just to give you some examples, but I mean in reality, so the idea of combining emission with transmission demography in a single gantry and single device dates from the 70s, the 50s and 60s, right? So you see the papers by Minor, Keller, Edwards, Anger, Sorensen. So all of them highlighted so the papers, the need for combining emission with transmission tomography, but the first one actually who materialized this concept 
into a real physical system is this famous scientist called Bruce Hasegawa from UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. So he got the donation of an X-ray CT system from GE, from General Electric, and then he modified it with his PhD students to get a system that enables simultaneous acquisition of emission tomography with technetium, for instance, 140 kV, uh, along with uh, an X-ray beam, so basically with the emission close to 70 kV, and the discrimination between the two signals was uh, achieved uh, through energy discrimination. So here's semiconductor detectors, uh, yeah, hyperpure uh, germanium, because they have a very high uh, energy uh, resolution. And they acquired so few patients, this is one of them, a neuroblastoma, which is uh, a terrible disease. You see the uptake in this malignant lesion here, so superimposed on the X-ray CT, so that you know exactly where the lesion is uh, located. All right, uh, I'm not sure how long time I still have, so let, let me try to finish in five minutes. Is it okay, five minutes? All right. So this is the PET CT scanner and how it operates in the clinic. So David Townsend is the person who designed the system. And the design concept was actually initiated at Geneva University Hospital so in our units when they, uh, a clinic, an oncologist entered into the room and he saw this open space here, sorry. He saw this open space between the two systems and he said, uh, guys, if you put an X-ray detector and an X-ray tube on the other side so we can combine the two imaging modalities. So the design concept was a slightly different in the sense that what was uh, actually designed is a sequential instead of a simultaneous system. So we start basically with the acquisition of what we call the scout scan. Uh, so you've got the X-ray detectors on the top here, and then the X-ray tube. Uh, no, the X -ray, this is the X-ray tube, and the detectors on the other side. And then you start with the scout scan with the planar image. And then once you get your uh, scout scan, or what we call also a topogram, so we define the axial field of view, and then you start the acquisition of X-ray CT exactly so as they described it um, earlier. So you rotate the system around the patients. And then you basically push the patient towards the PET detectors. Right, sorry. Anyway, so I think you, you, you got the, you basically push, yeah, the detector, the patient through the PET detectors and then you call the PET image. And then you fuse the two and present them to the MD. So this is the system that I showed you before for small animal imaging. So we can basically have trimodality system like the one I'm showing you here with the X-ray CT, single photon emission tracer, and then a positron emission tracer. And this is exactly your question regarding the radiation dose delivered to patients, which could be an issue, um, because you're basically adding up the contributions from the different imaging modalities, scale scans, so this is between yeah, 0. Point something to 0. 0.6 millisieverts, depending on the acquisition parameters. Spiral CT is usually low dose scan that we use only for attenuation correction, anatomic localization. Few millisieverts still. The injection of the tracer, so we usually inject between 200 and 300 megabecrals, so between 5 and 7 millisieverts. So you have the notion of millisieverts, right? So you compare to Basically, well, in Switzerland, I know that we have uh, an annual exposure close to uh, between three and four millisieverts. I guess, yes, yeah, same number as in Algeria. And uh, then, so you, uh, uh, at the end, so we usually inject the contrast medium to the patient to acquire the, the diagnostic quality CT. And if you combine all the factors together, so you get close to 20, 25 millisieverts, which could be extremely high and this is what basically generated so a number of concerns in the not only the scientific literature but in New York Times and that was actually a big issue in the in Europe and the United States especially in 2010 with the word CT those mentioned so more than 2000 times in the in the literature so this caused basically a paradigm shift in the way the CT scanner manufacturers designed the CT scanners because the the world was in increasing the number of detector rows. I have 16, I have 64, 128. The Japanese, they had the system with 256 rows. And then the, the world became to re reduce the radiation dose to the patients. 
And this is nicely discussed at this in the paper by Mahash and one of his colleagues, if you are interested, so I really encourage you to go through this. And uh, so they basically discuss this shift in paradigm. When doing so, when scanning the patients in whole body images, we've got malignant lesions. So this is basically what you see, the moving uh, lesions here, so they reflect the presence of cancer cells within the patients, right? These are patients with cancer. And uh, because of the respiratory motion, so the amount of signal which is emitted by those small tumors could be actually uh, distorted and could be also blurred. So you might miss some lesions. And I think I have a nice example here. So you see this static PET image on the left side. There is a lesion here. So because the images are acquired in static mode, so you miss the lesion, you don't see it. If you gate the data, so the gating mechanism, I'm going to show you, I think, in the next slide. So you simply synchronize the respiratory signal with the PET signal. And then you can split this into a number of respiratory uh, gates. And this enables you to, to, uh, to reconstruct. So eight or 10 uh, PET images corresponding to different phases of the respiratory cycle. And this tends to increase so the lesion detectability because you get rid of this blurring that takes place during the uh, respiratory motion. So this is how the data is acquired. So you basically acquire the data, PET data in this mode format, and then you have uh, an external device. Uh, it could be piezoelectric material, material that you have in, 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 on a belt, and the patient is going to breathe. So the pressure is going to change on this material, right? And this generates a signal. And then you correlate this with the data acquisition process, and then you reconstruct eight or 10 different phases of the respiratory cycle, knowing that a single respiratory cycle is close to five seconds for normal, normal subjects, right? And with this, you can basically reconstruct the images which are synchronized with the respiratory signal, and you can do this for X-ray CT for, and for the PET signal. And this is widely used in academic centers for radiation therapy, treatment planning. And I think I have an example here. Yeah, there, there is one. So you see the you, for lesions located in, in the lungs. I don't know what this. Let me see if we can get this work. Anyway, I think you saw it, right? It was moving and it started. So I think it's linked to the frequency of the beamer that you have. But anyway, I'm sure you've seen it in the beginning. So these are, these are moving targets here. And the idea is basically to use uh, uh, conformal radiotherapy where you adjust basically the shape and the size of the beam with the position and the shape of the, uh, of the tumor within the body so that you can treat, I mean, get the beam on and beam off, so depending uh, on the uh, shape and the position of the, of the lesion that you have in the field of view. The last part of my talk so is PET combined with MRI. So uh, MRI is a multi-parametric imaging procedure compared to CT where you have only the signal from the contrast medium. So different sequences generate different contrasts. And depending on the clinical indications, so we can get plenty or multiple uh, time sequences or, or uh, MR sequences. And combining those sequences with different PET sequences could be extremely uh, useful actually for a number of indications. So uh, the advantage from the physiological standpoint is that you get two contrast media, so reflecting uh, two physiological processes within the patient's body. And the advantage in terms of physics is that when you've got a position imaging tracer within the magnets, magnetic field, so the trajectory of the positrons is going to be impacted by the magnetic field and then you can improve the uh, in-plane uh, spatial uh, resolution. So different design trends have uh, emerged in the literature, a la PET CT, which means a sequential design, one PET and one MRI separated by a certain distance to avoid interference between the two. Putting the PET as an insert inside the magnetic mm -hmm. field and using the detector technologies that I mentioned before, MR compatible, or integrating the two subsystems into a single gantry with the more powerful so, uh, design concepts. Different photo detectors, as I mentioned before, so let me skip this, PMTs, APDs, and silicon PMs, with some advantages and, and drawbacks, obviously. And these are the systems which are um, available in, on the market. So we're lucky to have this system from 
Siemens about 10 years ago, so kind of pioneers on the field. I think it was the second one worldwide. The first one was installed in New York. And this is, I think I've got an animation which better shows you those concepts. So this the system installed by G in Zurich. So it's um, PET CT and uh, an MRI located in uh, uh, an adjacent room. So you basically so get the patients on his bed directly on uh, after the PET CT on the MRI, and then you've got so a mechanism that enables you to put the coordinates. Simply put in the coordinate space uh, system in, in, in common to get uh, extremely well aligned images. So this is one uh, design concept. And for those who attended so the conference yesterday, I think I showed these different design concepts by uh, from sequential uh, acquisition to simultaneous acquisition from Siemens. Um, uh, General Electric, who have very interesting, interesting design concept, they use uh, silicon PMs. Uh, actually, so to enable the implementation of time of flight technology, contrary to the avalanche photodiodes, which have very low uh, coincidence time resolution, so there is no way to get time of flight implemented on this type of technologies. And this is another design concept from these Chinese companies that I mentioned at the United Imagine, and some images that are produced from these devices, so for the brain, cardiovascular disease. Uh, so extremely high spatial resolution combined with uh, high um, sensitivity of molecular signal, and this obviously has pretty large number of clinical indications. What about the future? So I think we thought um, in some debates that PETs combined with CT is going to be replaced by PETs combined with uh, MRI, and this was basically the topic of heated debates in the scientific uh, literature. This, uh, we, th th that was basically what was expected in the future. The problem of PET-MRI is that the clinical indications were not extremely well established. And uh, some papers actually discussed those issues in a very provocative way. So you see the title of this uh, paper here. PET-MRI is a solution looking for a problem, which means that uh, this is the technology-wise development, which is looking for clinical problem, and then a number of other papers actually, so with the same uh, provocative uh, titles. And uh, we believe that um, PET CT was adopted so uh, after its introduction in 2000. Uh, extremely, um, now you see the slope here, so uh, it's extremely wide adoption. Spec CT followed a different trend, but still it's widely used in the, in the clinic. And then PETMRI had some issues in the beginning, but we believe that with redefinition of the technology, so this technology is going to see the light, and uh, clinical adoption might take more time, but it's probably going to happen. So just one couple of slides. There is just to highlight again the relevance and the usefulness of quality control. So you need to, to operate so those systems, you need qualified people who have the appropriate skills. They need to know the standards and how to check the quality to do the, um, what we call the um, uh, initial tests following the installation of the systems, to be able to discuss with the scanner manufacturers, have access to phantoms basically to perform these scans which is not using usually the case in, in our country here. There are some dynamic systems. I just wanted to show you this for the estimation of the ejection fraction. So you need to really negotiate with the manufacturers before operating the systems in the clinic. And the, if this knowledge is basically missing, so this is what is going to happen. And I think I'm going to end my talk here. Good. Thank you so much.